Hallo München, wie geht es euch? Ich spreche nur ein kleines bisschen Deutsch und so, I'll continue in English. Uh, I'm Tim Merrill um, and that photo was clearly taken a few years ago. Now, where's the clicker? Ah, they've stolen the clicker. We'll be one second. Someone got the clicker backstage. Hooray, thank you. <laughs> It must be a presentation. Um, I'm from DigiCapital. Uh, we're an AR and VR advisor, and we do four things. Uh, we've got our analytics platform, which is an AR and VR dashboard with over half a million data points. You'll see in a second. It's so you can answer questions in minutes that would take you weeks without the cost of doing it yourself. Reports about the industry, uh, we published our latest one a couple of weeks ago. It's 300 pages long. So if you like facts and data, it's good. Uh, strategy consulting for large corporates as they try to enter the industry, and also for startups as they try to accelerate faster. And investment banking, helping corporates to buy smaller companies and helping startups uh, to sell their companies so they can go and live on the beach. Now, today, we're going to talk about the reality ecosystem as a starting point. We've got a few other things to talk about as well. And this is really what AR and VR need to go big. And there are a lot of different pieces to the puzzle across mobile AR, smart glasses, and VR. I'll start with active users. Now, for a platform to be a platform, it needs active users, and lots of them. Um, tens of millions are a starting point. Hundreds of millions are better. But really, billions are what we're aiming for. Um, when we look at mobile AR, we've already seen with Pokemon Go, with Snapchat, with WeChat, that it's possible to achieve tens and hundreds of millions of users and more. With smart glasses, it's too early to tell. It, it hasn't really gone to scale yet, so we don't know. With VR, it hasn't reached that level in terms of active users. And even Mark Zuckerberg at, at Oculus Connect um, was saying how it needs to scale much more. The next thing is high frequency users. And if there's one thing that we've learned from mobile, it's that high usage, high frequency equals revenue. So the top 1% mobile apps in terms of revenue have 35 times the daily active usage of the top 5%. For mobile AR, again, it's already been proven that it's possible to do with Pokemon Go, Snapchat, and so on. For smart classes, it's too early to tell. For VR, um, our user strategy team um, does user testing for uh, VR and AR apps. And consistently with VR apps, what we've been told when we ask, um, you know, when would you use these apps, even if you, the, the users love them, is they use them evenings, weekends, and holidays. So not great for frequency. The next are critical use cases. Um, when we think about new technology, we think of it as being a range from valuable to critical. Something's valuable if it might be technically hard to do, it might be really cool, but it's something where it doesn't fundamentally change the user experience, and not that many users care about it. A use case is critical if it fundamentally transforms a use case that a lot of people care about, then it couldn't be done in any other way. Now, the, the first critical use case, really, for the whole ecosystem, we think, was shown at Google I.O. earlier this year. Uh, and that was the example where they solved a problem that we all have. When you come out of a train station and you get out Google Maps and it says, go south, you don't know where south is. They showed how using computer vision with Google Lens combined with maps, you can point your phone where you are. It recognizes the scene. It, it gives you an arrow against where you are in augmented reality on mobile AR to show you which way to go. It gives you a fox to follow. When I was in the audience at Google I.O., there was a visceral wave of enthusiasm when that example was shown, because it's a problem we all share. So I think that's the first critical use case. For smart glasses, there aren't critical use cases yet. Um, they may come across from mobile AR. We think they're more likely to be bespoke, be specific to that platform. For VR, critical use cases haven't really emerged yet. Um, if, if you think about mobile, Uber launched three years after the iPhone launched. We're already three years into the VR market. There isn't a critical use case yet. The next is critical apps. Um, with the apps on your phone, um, you use about nine a day and about 30 a month. And on average, you download no apps every month. Um, and this applies pretty much globally. So for a critical use case to actually get used, it needs to be in an app that you use all the time. So it could be something like Maps or Amazon 
or something which is so insanely great that you would actually bother to download it. And again, for mobile art, it's still a little early to tell, and same for smart glasses. And again, with smart glasses, some of the mobile AR apps may come across two smart glasses, but the critical apps there we think are more likely to be specific to that platform. For VR, it has the same challenge that with critical use cases. It's hard to think of a critical VR app, um, even if you love Beat Saber. Then we go to um, cloud and data. Now, AR cloud um, looks like it's going to be the cloud layer for mobile AR and smart glasses. Um, there are still some questions about business model, um, but it's looking very positive. For VR, you've got various people talking about blockchain as being the cloud layer for VR. It's a challenge to try and avoid what Steve Wozniak calls um, the blockchain bubble. So there are questions there. Then we go to critical hardware. Um, for mobile AR, you already all have the critical hardware in your pockets. You've all got smartphones, probably a lot of you iPhone 10s or advanced Android phones. Um, for smart glasses, it's too early, uh, despite what many people will tell you. Um, and for VR, again, there isn't really critical hardware. There isn't hardware that people couldn't live without, and the evidence is really the, the size of the installed base. Then we go from there down to investment, where there's already been significant investment into mobile AR, um, and into smart glasses, and into the underlying technologies. With VR, VCs have become relatively uninterested in the VR market really over the last 12 months. Then lastly, leaders. And when I'm thinking about leaders, I'm really talking about at the large scale when we're looking at the companies that will really lead the market at the overall ecosystem level. And that none, none have really emerged yet for any of the pieces. You have strong players like Facebook, Apple, Google, and so on. But nobody's really going to be clearly the dominant player. The one that has the greatest potential appears to be Apple. So when we look at the different parts of the market together, both mobile AR and smart glasses, it's too early to tell uh, in terms of where the market's going to go at an overall stage. And for VR, it looks like it needs to try harder. The next thing we're going to talk about is something that some of you may have seen already, um, the global industry survey that we did together with AWE, where, as well as the hard data that we've got, we wanted to find out what you had to say and really understand at the global level what the market was thinking. And it turned out to be very much the view from the top. Um, uh, a lot of the companies participated, as many in this room, were startups, uh, then a good a number of corporates, so large companies, and service providers. And when it came to the people who completed the survey, it was CEOs were about a third, and together with other C-level executives, it was a bit over 40%. So it's the really view from the top of the industry. In terms of the companies, again, not surprisingly, the bulk of them were startups making less than a million dollars, a few up to five million, as well as a good smattering of corporates and also the few startups that are making over a hundred million. And one of the themes that really emerged very clearly was a geographic one. Um, and it's that, at the moment, most startups in particular aren't really making money outside of their own countries and regions. So at a time when you're starting to see actual revenue growth in multiple markets, you're staying at home too much. And so basically, you need to get on a plane and see if you can make revenue elsewhere. So to put some numbers to this, um, as you can see, and the way to read this is the companies are based on the left-hand side. That's where the headquarters is. And the, where the revenue is, is on the right. Most companies in most regions make most of the money domestically or in the local region. But when we start to look at how, how things go overall elsewhere, what you see is some interesting patterns. First off, Asia is already the largest revenue region, and as we, we project will be considerably larger than both North America and Europe combined. Europe, which we'll come back to this year, it looks like it's going to be larger than North America in terms of revenue. But when you look at, say, what you and the Asian companies are doing in terms of how you go outside of your own markets, what you see in the numbers is an opportunity. If you look at European companies, um, when you go outside of Europe, you tend to go to North America which is not surprising. The lure of Silicon Valley is all very enticing. But North America is the most competitive market. If you're basing your out outreach in the States in Silicon Valley, I can tell you from experience, it's the most expensive market in terms of everything, particularly engineers. So you are tending to be uh, avoid going to Asia. And actually, when it looks, comes to Asia, you're actually more parochial than the Americans, which is interesting. It's not what you'd normally expect from European companies. For the Asian companies, when they go outside, and they are more international than all the Western companies, they also tend to go to North America. Now, the reason they do this is they recognize that Europe 
is the largest region, but the fragmentation is something they don't understand how to manage. Similarly, when European companies start looking at Asia, the complexity of it, the different regions, the different languages, the different cultures, are challenging. And there's an opportunity in that, because you couldn't really go into China, Japan, South Korea without domestic partners. The Asian companies couldn't really go into Europe effectively without domestic partners. So we're now at a stage of the market where, in terms of how you think about international growth and strategic partnerships, there is an opportunity to partner with Asian companies to try and actually make trade go in both directions. There's potential for, for all of you there. Then if we look more broadly in terms of what we, what we learned, um, in terms of platforms, more of you care about mobile AR um, than anything else, then smart glasses and VR. For mobile AR, it looks like a two-horse race between ARKit and AR Core. So while a lot of the other platforms are ones that you care about, not, not as much as, as those two. And so what that indicates is for those platforms, they need to clearly differentiate themselves if they're going to be able to actually thrive. For smart glasses, again, it looks a little bit like a two-horse race in terms of where the industry's focused. For enterprise, you're focused on HoloLens. For consumer, even though Magic Leap 1 isn't a consumer product yet, you're focused on Magic Leap 1, and all the others indexed much lower. Then lastly, in relation to VR platforms, not surprisingly, it was a, a, a really even race between HTC, Facebook, a bit for Windows, and a few of the others. Um, and this survey was completed in the last couple of days, just around the time Oculus Quest launched. So we'd actually expect Facebook and Oculus to go a bit higher in the next survey. What's interesting about this is that, that all of Google's offerings didn't index very well. So you seem to be less focused there in relation to VR. Um, and Sony PlayStation, even though it's the, the premium market leader, also didn't index well. We think Sony didn't because, as you can gather from this room, most of you are not games developers. So because PlayStation VR is attached to PlayStation, if this was game specific, we think it would index much higher. Then we looked at why your customers are buying your products and services. Why are they actually paying you? Um, and we looked at enterprise use cases, which came out on top, then B2B customers and um, uh, consumer end users. For consumer end users, you think they're buying to have fun, learn, and explore. So nothing unusual. There are things you would expect. When you start to look at the enterprise and B2B, and by B2B, I mean companies where they buy your products and services to incorporate in their own that they sell on to other consumers or enterprises, you see very different dynamics and very different drivers. The number one um, thing for enterprises, for, so for large companies, is increasing productivity. Innovation's in there as well. While innovation scores very highly for B2B customers, gaining competitive advantage came much higher in this part of the survey. And so when you think about what that might mean and look at the differences, you see productivity, number one for enterprise, the last one for B2B. So that indicates that the large corporates are really, really, really care about saving time, saving cost. So it's about efficiency. When you look at B2B customers, so the people who are trying to sell products and services incorporating your own, it looks like they care more, most about competitive advantage. And so what that might indicate for you, those of you who are on the sales side, is you've got less pricing flexibility with your enterprise customers, because they're likely to be more price sensitive, and more flexibility with your B2B customers, because they care about getting the best of breed in terms of market, so they can actually do better when they go to market. When we talked about how do you, does your company make money, again, not surprisingly, enterprise and B2B came out uh, highest by a large margin. But if you add all of the individual consumer-focused business models together, you see that actually they also score very well. What's interesting there is there's a very strong overlap between those different business models. So it's clear there's a lot of experimentation on the consumer side in terms of making money in the early market. When we talked to enterprise companies about where they focused, education, manufacturing, resources, a range of other areas, the surprising one was that government, including military and financial services, indexed very low whereas those two sectors have some of the largest budgets of anybody in the world. So there might be an opportunity for some companies here. Then when we looked at the consumer market, again, we got some interesting things. Um, in terms of the app store categories, so people who are making their money from in-app purchases and premium apps, games, entertainment, so entertainment broadly, by far the, the top sectors that you're focused on, followed by education and then everything else. In terms of the advertiser categories and e-commerce categories, a lot of the areas you would expect, but not necessarily the highest ad spend areas. So there's actually a lot of opportunity in the marketplace, and we'll come back to that later. The last piece we asked was about what the industry and you need to scale. 
And this was interesting. It was very similar to our own thinking on this when we were talking about the ecosystem before. Number one reason, number one thing that the industry needs, critical use cases. It was really refreshing. The industry recognizes that even though all of you will happily talk about how your product or service is the best in the world and everybody uses it, you recognize that there aren't critical use cases at scale yet. That's the number one. And then active users. So really, the industry recognizes it's all about the user. It's about the use case and the users. When asked about what you need to scale, new products and services, which isn't surprising given the state of the market, bigger customer and client budgets, and more effective go-to-market. And that really comes back into the last piece we asked about, which was what's on your roadmap for the next 12 months? The number one, strategic partnerships. So again, coming back to what we were talking about before, when we think about the international potential, when you're looking at those strategic partnerships on your roadmaps, there's an opportunity for you to look beyond partnerships in your own market, in your own region, and look more broadly. And so again, when you're thinking about which regions you focus on, looking to Asia, as well as the obvious one of the states, is worthwhile. Now lastly, we'll come to Europe itself, um, uh, where uh, some of you hopefully have already have seen the uh, Europe report that we did with AWE. And one of the things that came out of our uh, platform was this, which is this year, Europe um, should pass um, North America in terms of revenue for AR and VR globally and continue to accelerate beyond the States. Even though America is the second largest individual country market after China and will stay that way, at a regional level, there's a lot of potential in Europe. And now we'll go through a bit more detail. If we can switch to my laptop, please. Hopefully. We, we, there we are. Um, this is the demo version of DigiCapital's analytics platform. Um, and we're going to dive into some of the detailed numbers here. Um, in this demo version, you won't see the numbers, data, and axes that you get in the subscription version. If you're interested in that, go to the website and have a look. In terms of what's in the platform, there are three broad areas. There's platforms, revenue, and ecosystem. And we'll look at the market where it's going in those terms. Let's jump over hardware sales and go straight to hardware and software installed base. And here, if we look at the big blue bars, that's mobile AR. And that should have over 900 million installed base by the end of the year and approach around 3.5 billion within five years. But if we back out of that and just look at the headset market, we get a very different growth picture. We were looking at the market growing to a little bit over 100 million headsets in the same time frame. Now, I guess the obvious question is, is where does all this data come from? Um, and I'll give you an example. If we look at, say, PlayStation VR as an example, um, we get hard data directly from Sony in terms of sales. Uh, we've also got excellent secondary data in terms of attachment rates and attrition rates for peripherals for PlayStation. So it gives us a pretty good basis for both the historic and forecast numbers. If we then back out of that and look at mobile AR and look at AR and AR core, AR kit and AR core, we know the install rates for new versions of iOS and Android, compatibility by device in terms of AR kit and AR core, and also from talking to the phone manufacturers, which of them are configuring the devices to be compatible. If we now then look at revenue and where the market's going, and what we see is both mobile AR and smart classes outpacing VR via a large margin in revenue terms in the long term. And also the business models, which are uh, growing and scaling over time. As well as how things break out by country. And the country piece is interesting. When we start to look at the regional piece, and this is the five-year data, not just a single year. You can see how Asia, Europe, and North America compare over the next five years. But let's go a bit deeper, because one of the things uh, we did before today was ask you for questions as to what sort of things you wanted to know. And one of the things we were asked about was country rollouts. So let's work through an example. If we look, go into, dive into the App Store and look at, say, a mobile AR company in the education space, and let's say that they were based here in Europe, let's put them in France. And if they think they can take 10% of market revenue next year, what's that revenue actually worth? What's their addressable market? Well, next year in France, mobile AR education apps, 3 million revenue. So if you can take 10% of that market, that isn't a huge amount of revenue to support your team and how you build your business. So obviously, as well as talking to VCs, you need to find ways to grow revenue. Now, you could go to Belgium, but that's not going to make a big difference. 
let's say you want to go into the, the darker countries, the German-speaking countries, so Germany, Austria, and let's find Switzerland. There we go, Switzerland. So what does that revenue market look like for mobile IR education apps? So now 8.6 million. So okay, 10% of that's getting a bit bigger, but it's still not a lot if you really are trying to expand and build your business. So then you have to make a decision. Do you, do you invest a lot, go and raise a bunch of money, invest, invest a lot, try and build a bridge into North America, and go to the States, and go to Silicon Valley, or do you look to Asia? So let's look at the relative difference as to what that would mean for your business as you think about those country rollouts. So let's start with the States. If we add, let's say you do, you do all of North America, so you do Canada as well. Now the digital market next year for you looks like this. It's 26.2 million, that's a lot more. So you can see there are obvious benefits to going to the North American market, but also it's extremely competitive. So let's do a comparison with the major Asian markets. So keep that 26 million figure in your head. Let's get rid of North America, and let's go into Asia, and add in China, Japan, and South Korea. Russia will come back to. <laughs> um, so what does that market look like? OK, 45 million market. So you can see immediately if you actually have the right partners who have reached across Asia. So pick a company like, say, a Tencent, where they're huge in China, but they're very strong in, in South Korea, have some presence in Japan, or Naver out of South Korea, they're also very, very, very strong in Japan with Line. You're potentially looking at a much larger revenue market. Now, you have complexities. You need to do it with partners. So you need to share some sort of revenue, have a commercial arrangement. But again, when you start thinking about those strategic partnerships and how you grow internationally, these are the things you need to understand. Now, the other thing here is that even though 10% you know, of that market might be 4.5 million, which is, sounds great, if you're trying to build a big company, that's not necessarily enough for growth. So you may need to go and talk to VCs. And if you do, now rather than talking about the large, you know, here's the total market, here's x billion dollars, you can say, here's my market on my platforms in my countries, credibly. You can actually get down to the detailed granular level of data that you need to. So just knowing the market, and again, that's, that's for the App Store, if you're looking at, say, e-commerce revenue, you've got different categories. So rather than the 23 App Store categories, you've got all the different e-commerce categories, or looking into enterprise revenue. Again, you've got all the different uh, enterprise sectors from, from cars to clothing to toys and so on. But knowing the market isn't enough. You need to know everyone in the market, and you particularly need to know your competitors. Now, we get approached by a lot of companies, and almost every single startup that approaches us says, we have no competitors, or oh, here are our competitors, and they're not as good as us. Every single time, there are at least three, four, five, six competitors, particularly internationally, they've never heard of, they're not aware of. And so, let's say you were in the medical space, and you want to know who are the different competitors globally. Well, now, very quickly, you can go in, you can take a look, you can see who they are, you can see what they do, you can see their products and services, who's invested in the stages they're at, and understand the competition. And also for corporates, you can also find your partners here. But the next thing which has been a challenge is valuation. Um, up until now, there hasn't really been an easy way for folks to actually come up with valuations for their companies. So because of our, our, our team also has an investment banking background, um, we did over 900 individual company valuations to make it easy. So if you're looking at, say, um, uh, photo and video as an example. So you can, and let's say you were raising a seed round, you can see that the average valuation for business AR and VR seed rounds is 11 million. But it's not average everywhere, that's average globally. So you need to understand, okay, in Europe, what's that look like? So if you're talking to a VC here, you're talking about an average valuation of 22 million. But if you're talking to a VC from North America, then that valuation looks like 10 million. Or if you're talking one from Asia, and this again is in the current market, is probably one of the more interesting ones, because Asian money is looking for a place to go, 17.5 million. So this is the sort of stuff that you need to know. And then moving on quickly, as well as all of the investments and acquisitions, and also uh, the investors and acquirers, again, we're talking to VCs, a lot of startups struggle um, in terms of how they actually are able to get to VCs. Now you can look at any individual sector 
and see, oh, we've got 1,300 VCs in here, who the VCs are, who they've invested in, whether you're competition or otherwise. And lastly, I'll wrap up with this. Let's say you decided, you thought you wanted to raise some money from Mark Andreessen firm, Andreessen Horowitz in the States, because you thought you were really special. So you want to find out about them. So what deals have they done? What we see is they've done one or two deals each quarter um, uh, historically. They've never done more than that. So if they've, done, if they've invested in one company, your chance is 50%. If they've invested in two companies this quarter, you can't raise money from them. Let's say you were doing a Series A. What you see is they've only ever done three Series A in this sector. But let's say you still think they're the investor for you. So let's see what their portfolio looks like. And we see they've invested in Improbable. So let's go back to the leaders board and find Improbable. I'll try and type correctly. There we go. So if you know Herman or Rob, now you can actually have a chance of getting a warm introduction to Mark Andreessen's firm in the States. Und so, vielen Danke. Tschüss. Thank you, Tim.